Good afternoon and welcome to Helping the Help Desk fend off the latest wave of cyber attacks, a health system CIO production sponsored by Highland Healthcare. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the founder and editor in chief of Health System CIO, and I'll be your moderator today. We're looking forward to your participation. You can send in your questions or comments at any time in the Q&A box, and we will take them later in the program. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today. First, we're going to go about 35 minutes with our main panel discussion featuring Kathy Hughes, VP and CISO with Northwell Health. Teresa Tontat, VP, Associate CIO and CISO with Texas Children's Hospital, and Colleen Surhall, Chief Clinical Officer and AVP of Customer Success with Highland. And then we will have our Q&A. So let's jump right into it. Obviously, an important and timely topic today. Lots to cover. So, Kathy, let's start with you. Can you give us an overview of your organization and your role? Sure. So Northwell is New York's largest health system with 21 hospitals, approximately 900 outpatient facilities. Uh, we're also New York's largest private employer with over 85,000 team members. Um, as the chief information security officer, I'm responsible for managing Northwell's information and cybersecurity program, as well as our IT risk initiatives. Um, and I do that by employing a layered defense in-depth strategy, which includes comprehensive suite of policies, uh, technical security measures that protect the organization against theft, loss, and unauthorized access. All right, excellent, Kathy. Thank you. Teresa? Sure. Thanks for having me, Anthony. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Teresa Tondat, and I work for Texas Children's Hospital and Texas Children's Health Plan Systems. So Texas Children's is the largest pediatric hospital across the United States. Um, we have over 5 million um, patients in our systems, and we also have a health plan arm for Texas Children's Insurance that covers roughly 450,000 members across Texas. We have around 900 plus beds. Um, most of our facilities are located in the Houston, Texas area in the Texas Medical Center. But just recently this year in February, we opened up our first community full service hospital in Austin, Texas. So very excited for that. And we continue to grow more in Central Texas in the upcoming years. Um, I currently serve as the Associate CIO um, while still also having the CISO title as well. Um, have a team of roughly 500 plus technology professionals. But for our security team specifically, we have a hybrid team of about 80 or plus engineers covering all things around governance, risk compliance, IT, asset, um, IT access management, as well as uh, security engineering, and of course, our security operations center. Excellent. Very good. Colleen? Thank you, Anthony. And um, I, this is fun, one joining this conversation with two women, um, but also uh, not necessarily orchestrated by health system CIO, but um, two leaders from organizations that I've personally been involved with for 15 plus years um, on the vendor side. So uh, both fantastic organizations and really serious about the the defense strategy as as Kathy talked about it. So um, coming together and and learning from each other is is part of the joy of being part of this group. So thank you for bringing us together, Anthony. Well, thank you for for joining. So we're going to have a great conversation. So let's start off by talking about the you know sort of setting the stage with with. The role of the help desk, and it's a very, very important role. How critical is a smoothly functioning help desk to a high functioning IT department and overall health system? Um, and what is the relationship between clinicians and the help desk and how important is availability and speed in addressing and resolving issues? Obviously very important, but we'll put some more color around that. Kathy, let's start with you. Sure, so um, the help desk is really the first point of contact. And in many cases, the only point of contact for uh, the general from the clinical and the user community uh, to contact IT. 
And typically when they're calling, it's because they have a problem or an issue. And they're looking to get that issue resolved as quickly, efficiently, and expeditiously as possible because it's likely preventing them uh, from doing their job, um, which it could include providing direct clinical care. So it's extremely important um, that the help desk be uh, not only knowledgeable and, and educated about how to address the users, but also for them to be very courteous and professional and empathetic to the position that they're in. So uh, because they're that first line of defense and, and the primary contact into the IT organization, their role is absolutely vital to the organization. Very good. Um, Teresa, anything you want to add to that? Um, I think Kathy covered it. We're very much aligned with um, what she mentioned at Texas Children's. Um, the only thing I can add for more specifics is Texas Children's, we call it our service desk because their responsibility is high level of service to all of our organization. That includes our employees, our clinicians, um, and our providers and our affiliate partners. We have an affiliation with Baylor College of Medicine. So we have over 2,000 physicians that pick up the phone and call the help desk for any type of technology needs, um, whether urgent or not. Um, we have a, a service desk that is hybrid, if you will, that opens 24 by 7, 365 days a week. So being available um, with very high levels of service metrics is very critical, right? Typically, when someone calls our service desk, we have indicators if it is related to patient safety or if it's a request needed for more of a less acute need for business operations. And they have certain metrics and SLAs, service level agreements, to how quickly they can respond. Um, for us, I, I am pretty proud that we're able to hit our metrics of 70% first call resolution. Because we all know not every call that comes in the help desk can be resolved by an agent on the line. There's tier two, tier two, tier three support, um, which results in different service level agreements. But um, I would feel that the urgency and the capability of our service desk representatives being well prepared, um, professional, as Kathy mentioned, and courteous is equally important to resolving the issues that may go to tier two and tier three as well. Let's just cover the uh, sort of the construction of the help desk because that might help with the conversation. Kathy, are are all the help desk people employees or is any of this outsourced type thing? Some of them are um, contracted employees. Um, you know, uh, we do also provide twenty four seven, so it's a mix of of uh, you know in Northwell employees as well as contracted employees. Um, and most of them, if not all at this point, uh, do work remotely because that is, you know, with this new remote world and hybrid world that we're living in today and the technology uh, enables it, we're able to uh, leverage people um, no matter where they are to provide these services. Um, and the only thing I would uh, add that um, that Teresa just kind of made me think of is, is again, um, the importance of empowering help desk people with information and knowledge. And it's very critical that there are you know, knowledge or knowledge based um, articles and references that are readily available at the click of a fingertip because the, the help desk or that we also call them the service desk or serv the service desk doesn't know everything all the time and you never know what question is going to come in or what kind of problem is going to come in that's going to require um, somebody, you know, some help. So it's really important to make sure that there is very comprehensive, searchable, easy to find knowledge for the help desk agents to access so they can be as productive and efficient and helpful as, as possible. Uh, Teresa, same type of setup with a hybrid of employees and contract? So for us, um, the help the service desk representative is through a partnership, through a managed service provider that we have a very strong relationship over the past, I want to say, 10 plus years. Um, the leadership over our service desk are all FTEs um, dedicated to Texas Children's. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to mention earlier, too, is that um, we get 
um, because being the largest children's hospital, we have around 15,000 calls a month, and that's probably on a, a lower end month. You know, we measure metrics of sometimes over 21,000 calls a, a month. So I think it's it's very important that we're able to have a support model that can flex and surge when needed. So for instance, in the IT world, when we have a significant change in our environment or we have an EMR upgrade, we have the, um, we're afforded the ability to flex our service desk team for all the shifts when nurses and clinicians come on site, right? So I think the, the setup that we have is very ideal for at least Texas Children's and the way that we are able to flex up and down as needed to still allow us to serve the community when they call in for assistance. Excellent. Colleen, let's bring you in here. Um, your thoughts uh, as a you know clinician by training <clears throat> on <clears throat> what that help desk, that service desk means to busy clinicians and what those interactions mean. Well, and I think Kathy and Teresa really hit it. Sense of urgency. Um, I think, you know, depending on the generation which the clinical staff comes from, that's a nice way of saying for the old people like me, um, you know, there's a sense of nervousness when you're trying to reach out, particularly as we have moved to more of a self-service model in our healthcare organizations, certainly the technology partners, um, there's a level of, I think, importance that our doctors and nurses and, you know, all the other uh, care departments have in talking to somebody and making sure that the criticality that they're hearing in their own brain and their own assessment can get clearly articulated to the, the service desk. So um, I love the, the the empathy, you know, teaching people what it means, uh, what the mission means. Teresa and I were talking earlier, you know, we're in a mission driven business uh, and being able to uh, connect with that front line becomes really important. Um, I also, as a clinician and, and certainly as part of Highland, I'm talking to customers all over the world. And one of the questions I'm getting regularly now, well, two, two questions. Number one, how are other people flexing their help desk or their service desk? Um, how do they meet all the hours, the skill sets? Um, and so hearing about the partnerships that have been built over time um, that these two organizations are using, I think is going to be really helpful for people that listen to the, the webinar. Mm -hmm. um, the, the second piece is with all the technology that's changing, the skill set that your people need, you know, we, we think so much about the clinical piece, but if you've ever been in a business office at the end of month, end of quarter, end of year, and you can't get the information that you need to close out the business, certainly uh, our CFOs find that really stressful. So being able to meet those needs becomes important. Yeah, right. think if I can add to yeah, please. that, um, and then Colleen, I think you hit the nail on the head is, I mean, in the beginning of setting up um, or transitioning to a new service desk provider, it's always difficult, right? Because you know, the partner that we have is not specialized in healthcare. So one of the things that we did immediately as we transitioned to our managed service provider was to ask them to fly into the hospital right? Let's, let's do rounding. Let's, let's make a connection point of all of the analysts that we have, the 40 or 50 plus analysts that rotates through different shifts. I need the leads and them to come in and take a look at what they're supporting and who they're supporting. It's not just a technology call, right? So they, they feel like a, we always say like, you have to be on the floor to really know a heartbeat of what's happening at the hospital. Um, and I think that went a long way, um, no matter if we partner with a, an outside resources or using our own staff to do the DAS, it's important that they know that they're an extension of Texas Children's and not, not a, a transactional you know, SOW that we just signed with the partner. And it, and it does take some time, right? And it's continuous oversight of the quality of the calls. Um, I know we've all probably, if we manage a service desk here, you're, you're doing audit calls all the time and you're training and you're using examples to get them better, you know, and with managed services, there's a lot of turnover. 
So how do you keep that process ongoing to make sure that you never lose touch of, of why they're working with Texas Children's and, and helping the physicians and the nurses and the business units, right, to, to resolve some of their technological issues. So it's, it's not just a technology, it's a people process and a culture conversation when it comes to the help desk. And, and it's impossible to do that within with just in-house staff, right? You can't do the 365. You can't scale up and down. That can't be done without outside help. Does that make sense, uh, Teresa? Yeah, I completely agree. That's the model that we've adopted, and it's worked well for us. Yeah. Let me, uh, Kathy, let me ask you a question because I'm interested in the relationship or the influence that security would have with the help desk. How does the help desk uh, structure leadership and reporting go up does it ultimately go up to the cio and what is what is as, as a leader of security what's your ability to work with the help desk to make sure that security is a part of them taking these calls and helping these customers yeah now that, that's a great question anthony and actually we've gone through, th uh, through some recent reorganization so um i now report uh directly to the cto and the help desk does as well. Um, and the CTO reports directly uh, to the chief digital officer. So um, that is uh, you know, how we've aligned ourselves. And it's really bringing all the different technology groups um, in sync under one area to really enable us to really focus as, as a team collaboratively. Um, so with the help desk, even prior to that re reorganization, um, we we provide very targeted training for a help desk about cybersecurity threats, specifically the threat of the phone scams or the vishing type scams, because those are being widely used um, and many healthcare systems, as well as other types of organizations have fallen victim uh, to those types of, of scams. So it's really important to educate them and not just once because there is high turnover, in the service desk or help desk, and you are dealing with contractor help, or uh, as Teresa mentioned, uh, service providers or offshore resources. So it's a continuous nonstop process and uh, using a variety of methods and tools to communicate out to them is really, really important because they're not, they do work 24 seven. So you can't like just get them into a meeting and go through things. You have to constantly send out reminders about what to look for, what are the red flags, what are the common types of scams, giving examples, specifically those that have affected other organizations so they know what to look for, and it's a little more tangible and concrete. Um, and to take that information and, and use that to kind of help explain why we have certain processes and procedures in place that require things like identity, verification before helping a particular user. Help desk people have access to a lot of systems. They have the ability to change within systems, uh, change information within systems. And they're typically uh, trying to please the person on the other end of the phone. So the threat actors know that and they take advantage of that during these, uh, these uh, voice scams. So it's really important that we emphasize to our service desk what these red flags or signs are for threat that threat actors use and some, uh, some of the more common tactics that are used, which can include a combination of a voice call as well as a phishing email or some kind of um, you know, uh, message to call a particular number to make them aware of these types of scams so that they're educated, they're aware, they know what to do. And they can under they understand that it's more important to be secure, be polite to the person on the other end because it it really could be somebody who needs to have their their password reset or their OTP code a destination changed, but that they understand the processes and procedures in place to make sure that's done in a secure way, um, and and giving them the skills that they need to explain to the caller. Um, what they what the protocols are, why we have the protocols in place, but to do it in a way that's um, quick and efficient, and ultimately, if it you know leads to resolution of the problem. So it's continuous education, continuous awareness. We do um, monthly uh, 
we do monthly communications out to all help desk folks. We enroll them in required training. We do targeted phishing exercises for them uh, to them um, that that um, that that really help us um, create the awareness. And we also uh, have a recognition program so that if help desk or service desk people are practicing good behavior and reporting suspicious events. Um, that we recognize and reward them and make sure that that we do that in a in more of a public forum so that p other people are encouraged to do the same so it's using a number of different tactics and techniques uh, techniques anthony to really emphasize the threat the the why the how and what to look for and what to do um, while remaining empathetic and using your their strong communication skills and trying to connect red dots so that they know how to recognize and report sus suspicious incidents. That's that's great stuff there, Kathy. I wanna just open it up for comments on what you've said. Le Colleen, any, any thoughts on what you're hearing? Well, yeah, Kathy, I'm really interested. Um, you know, clinical staff notoriously uh, does not, you know, they're, they're busy giving care and not always interested in doing the continuing education on our processes. But what are some of the um, strategies that Northwell's used to keep their front-facing clinical staff up to speed? I mean, you hit it. These tactics coming from bad actors are so sophisticated, uh, and that, that education is critical. Yeah. And so we use, and that's a great question because we have focused a, a lot of time and effort on our security awareness and training, not only for the help desk, but for our clinical staff. And we know there's no silver bullet. There's no one method that 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 reaches out to everybody. The the younger generation, they're into social media, right? So we use social media. We use screensavers, posters. Um, we do require training. We publish newsletters. We use digital signage. You know anything and everything. We use little um, handouts. We have little squishy fish that have you know if you just if you see a suspicious email, call this number, you know, any, uh, we, we try to, um, we do attend new hire training sessions. We give a, a quick little, um, you know, a quick little overview. And we say, here's what to look for in emails. And we tell them, by the way, as a new hire, you are a highly targeted group and we will be phishing you. So please click this report phishing button if you see something. Mm -hmm. So any and every way we can, we, we try to communicate out. Another thing we do is we do um, run enterprise phishing campaigns, and we um, we actually publish dashboards after each campaign um, that's available to all the leaders, clinical or not, within the organizations that show them how their teams did. You know, here's how your team did, and here's how specific people in your team did. And those results are only available to those leaders. They're not obviously available to everybody, but it's another tool that even the managers um, and, and, and the directors and other people in leadership uh, uh, roles are able to use to really help us communicate because really security is everybody's responsibility in the organization, not just my team. It's really, it's something that it's a cultural shift that people have to, every employee, every team member has to take ownership of security and be part of the security team. So we do use different methods, different messages to different audiences to try to reach the entire the entire enterprise. Teresa, your thoughts? Um, to Colleen's question, I, I think um, Kathy <laughs> gave a really great answer. Uh, I was just mad, I'm nodding my head, just like, yes, that's exactly. I, I feel that, you know, I've been in the cybersecurity space for quite some time, and we have done a fundamental shift, I feel, over the past 10 years. Um, to the point of cybersecurity, it's everyone's responsibility, not just the CISO's responsibility, not just the CIO's responsibility. And I and I do feel that, um, especially I know from my team, it sounds like it for Kathy too, is we've been we've we've turned our um, awareness training team into a marketing team because you need to make sure you can reach the audience because they all receive information differently. How I talk about security to a nurse will be very different of how I talk to someone that works in my finance department or my legal department, right? So you have to know how they like to consume awareness information and then simulate it in a way that it makes sense to them. 
right? So we have to do customized phishing simulation. Not everyone will click on a OneDrive for Business link because maybe nursing never gets those. Maybe nursing gets a stat record for certain clinical floors and yeah, they'll be vulnerable to potentially clicking on that. So um, we do a lot in the training and awareness um, area for across the system and our health plan. Um, I will say that one thing that we do frequently too is that when there is something in the media um, impacting another organization, specifically in healthcare, we take that opportunity and we get as much intel as we can and we share with our physician partners and our in chiefs on um, if we are aware of the tactic that was used to re that resulted in a ransomware or downtime procedures. And then we ask them to be an extension of our voice in their division chief meetings. And we leverage our chief medical information officer quite frequently to, to raise awareness across our physician community. Right, because they can speak the talk, they can give examples of how this could happen in their normal workflows. And, and we can do that too, but I think coming across from a physician to a physician goes a long way because they understand you know, security sometimes can be viewed as friction, right? but we don't want that. But here's why it's set up that way. It's really to protect you and the information you're dealing with ex-patient, right? And, and that story, it's all storytelling and marketing at the end of the day, but it is everyone's responsibility. And it's not just your employees, it is your extended partners and your faculty, your volunteers and your providers as well. Interesting point you make, Teresa, because if you think about everybody in healthcare that's delivering care, we, we really come at it from a scientific basis and data fills the scientific coffers, right? So, you know, I think that idea of using grand rounds to be able to talk about security and why this is important from a place of this is how we make ourselves better can be really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to share that with uh, some of our CISO, CTO, CIO friends in our ecosystem because I think that's a, a, it's something we don't think about how to leverage those those processes that are in innate and built in healthcare. Because we can't triple the size of our teams. Right, right. In order to, I think, Kathy, you mentioned you're one of the largest in your state too, is there's a lot of people that that message needs to touch. Mm -hmm. And it can't just all be delivered by the cybersecurity team for that right. institution. So when you get to that phase of maturity, which I, it sounds like, Kathy, you are, is you, you need advocates to... Yes to extend your voice because it's what's not said when you're not in that room that can really build the maturity of your cybersecurity program for the institution. Yeah, we refer to them as our cyber champions. So we want everybody to be a cyber champion in our crusade against the, the late the cybersecurity threats out there. So let's, let's take, a, Colleen, let's take a different angle here. If you were speaking to a room of security professionals, mm -hmm. What, from a from a clinician point of view, now security they're trying to balance. They have to do certain things. They have to put certain things in place. Now those things can sometimes feel like they're over the top, right? Now let me give you an example. When I've had to deal with verifications on certain things, sometimes it gets to the point where it feels ridiculous. I, I I'm asked which of these four streets did you live on 30 years ago. And I'm like, I don't remember. Like they sound familiar, but I don't. So my point is that anything can be taken to the an extreme to where now you're causing problems. So from a clinician point of view, what would you tell a room of security professionals about that kind of balance? Well, I, I think it comes back to the understanding the mission and the job at hand. So um, you know, a, a nurse, a doctor who has sitting in an emergency department dealing with a trauma case and suddenly they can't access an image um, that, you know, that that's really scary. And while they may be really calm, if they are very direct with the, the services desk or with, you know, the groups that are trying to resolve you know, that that is a, an urgency that is mission centric and we need to get all the right people engaged at the right time. But I also think the culture has changed so much. Certainly, um, you know, COVID moved us lightning fast 
into a different place. Um, I think before COVID, you know, I'd, I'd go to different places and hear clinicians speak about their concern. You know, why do I have to validate multiple times? Don't they know who I am? You know, I'm I'm the head of this department. They know who I am. But what, particularly what we saw and what was really championed, I'm going to say in the you know New York area through COVID, by really getting systems aligned, helping do that first responder piece, everything that had to happen that the rest of the states learned from, you know, how do you, how do you bring all of these physicians and nurses in to help the surge? How do you get them safe information? And, and you know, how do we control that? People remember, right? And now they're looking at things in 2024 and 2025. And um, I think our clinical staff are much more receptive to what might have felt like jumping through hoops before. Um, I love the data point. So the the Kathy made the point about the phishing, internal phishing exercises, and then being able to share that data back. Um, as a leader, being able to talk with someone to say, hey, you know, this is what's going on. How do we make it better? How do we make it faster for you, but safer for our organization and safer for our patients? That's an impactful conversation. Excellent point. Excellent point. All right. Here's what I want to drill down on where I'm seeing a really interesting dynamic. So in order to have a modern help desk to deal with the reality of, of life in a health system, we need to have this hybrid model where we're using third parties to handle some of these calls. This is a tremendous responsibility for these folks because they essentially have the keys to the kingdom and they're getting scammed. Their, their scam attempts are coming left and right. If I'm a help desk agent, I'm pretty sure I'm being uh, sort of judged on each call, right? You know, this call is being monitored and there's going to be a survey. You're going to get a survey after this call. So I'm deathly afraid of making people angry. I want it, right? Because, and that's how these scammers act. They act irritated and angry and probably bullying. So you've got someone who is is uh, sensitive to that. You've got this really tough dynamic where this individual is probably scared wants to provide your services, afraid for their job, and they're getting a lot of pressure from this caller who's representing some somebody very influential. This is a, a, the point, right? This is the point where we need things to work. So what I'm thinking is that you have to have the procedure, right? Which you all have. What is the procedure for identifying and confirming the identity of a caller? So you've got that and they get that. Now, the other interesting dynamic you, you both mentioned is we want to be very aware of what's going on out there, what the current scams are. And we want to then quickly adjust our standard procedure based on the current scams, right? We got to get that information from the wild and get it into the process and get it out to the people taking these calls. So that's a process and a workflow that's got to be established. Um, so I would like you to talk a little bit about that. And I'm guessing one of the messages you want to go out to your help desk people is you will not be fired for following procedure, right? Even if it is someone who's actually an employee and for whatever reason, they don't have the right information. They're not giving you the right answers and they're mad. As, you're not going to get fired for following procedure. Anyway, that all being said, I'd like to get reactions around the horn. So Kathy, your thoughts on what I said. Sure. So, Anthony, to your point, it's it's always a balance, right? There's it's a balancing act, and the help desk agent is really trying to balance the request from the caller um, against time because they are on the clock and they are being measured about how quickly and efficiently they respond to the caller, and they're trying to balance that against the process and procedure. Uh, to your point, it is extremely important, and I think. In general, um, people are accepting of the fact that their identity has to be validated. That's the most critical thing to do before really helping any type of user. And we have emphasized that and worked into our processes. You know, the easiest way to do that, which for us is, well, if someone calls and they want something, we are going to send them a code and they need to validate that, you know, that they are who they are because we, we, we have to validate everybody. We can't, we have to never trust and always validate. I mean, that's the whole underlying principle that we follow. And people understand that because they either themselves or know of people who have been victims of identity theft. 
um, or and they've heard about the large um, cyber attacks that have affect not only healthcare but other incidents. So I think they get it at this point. They understand it. Our job is to make that as as frictionless as possible and as efficient as possible. The help desk agents themselves, as well as their managers, and all the way up to the chief digital officer and and our president and CEO, even you know record and support the fact that if we can't get that validation, if the help desk agent or service desk agent can't get that validation, there's certain protocols that they have to follow, contacting a manager and getting them involved, as well as some behind the scenes processes. But they know that they, as long as they're polite, they uh, have a way to end that call in a very professional way and are explaining to the caller what the procedure is they need to follow if they're unable to comply or if we're unable to validate their identity. And I think that's the most critical thing is it's the identity validation in a frictionless way that um, will get service promptly and quickly so that if it really is a, um, a legitimate user who is having some kind of an access issue, and that's typically what people call about, or there's a problem with their computer or whatever it is, that that's getting the, the prioritization that it should. But at the same time, uh, enabling, with the to enabling them with the tools and um, awareness to recognize when a call might be suspicious and that they should report those and escalate those um, even while they're on the call. And that's always noted and never held against the person, even if it turns out to be, well, that really was so-and-so and they really needed this, but yes, they lost, they're in the Caribbean, they lost their phone and they don't remember what street they lived on 40 years ago. You know, that does happen as well, but that's a very small percentage. Mm -hmm. And then there were always very mindful to circle back with those people because these threat actors do have a tendency to impersonate senior executives. They'll throw names around. Um, and so we have a process specifically for senior executives because they might not be, you know, directly reachable for whatever reason. So through their admins or some other contact that's a trusted contact, we have a process to reach out to them. So we've tried to account for the different scenarios that have come up, but it really the root of, of really everything, depending on what the latest tactic is that's used by threat actors, is the identity the identity val validation and ensuring that the person really is who they say they are and you know and also we're also promoting a lot of technology because um, when a person's on the phone threat actors tend to prey on emotion they try to create a sense of urgency or or try to you know get them to be sympathetic to their situation or whatever when you're dealing with an online system, there's no emotion, right? It's like, here's the information we need in order for you to do this. Here's the process and procedure. So when you add the human element, it actually adds a little more risk. So yeah. we always try to, um, to um, refer people that are calling onto our online system to either reset passwords or do those more technical things where we can do the more detailed validation. For sure. Yeah, definitely. That human element creates a little risk. So Teresa, your thoughts? Um, the, the only thing I would add to what Kathy mentioned was, um, you know, the, the service desk reports into the CTO and the CTO reports into me and then my security team reports into me. So it has a lot of, there's a lot of synergies between the, the leadership level across all things help desk and also security. So that's a, I feel that's a, a good model that's worked well for us. Um, before the the big thing happened at the casinos in Vegas, right? And we all knew that they got through um, through social engineering their their service desk as well. We were we were already pushing all of our end users to use self service password reset and our virtual bot. Because to Kathy's point, there's no emotions in there. There's no human mistakes. You've already pre enrolled with your personal cell phone number that we validated. So that's your identity validation right there. All right, so the, the thought there was to leverage technology to enhance the user experience to be more productive than waiting on a call with the desk. Mm -hmm. And that in turn helped reduce our calls to the desk, right, to reduce um, wait times. So it was more really around customer service and speed to answer calls was the intention of using self-service password reset and our virtual bot. 
And then when the MGM situation happened and we knew exactly the tactic they were using, I think they were, many of us know it was a scattered spider group that had is very sophisticated in leveraging, you know, Eastern Hemisphere and Western Hemisphere threat actors as a team to call the help desk in a, in a more westernized voice, right? So it's, it, it sounds like someone that potentially works at MGM. Every time there's a situation that happens, as I said earlier, across healthcare, but across other institutions where the campaign and the attack vector is used for something that we can see a risk potentially for us, we make that very well known. Not just to our help desk, we did for our help desk at that time, but we let our entire senior executive team and our global population know that this is how it happened, which is why it raises the bar more on their vigilance. So it goes back to, there's no silver bullet with the technology you put in place. Like you can purchase many AI tools to identify the identity of the person calling, but there's still going to be holes in that process. So the ongoing awareness of what's happening around the globe from threat actors, whether they're targeting healthcare or not, it's very beneficial for the, the workforce and our service desk to know so that they can disseminate that information down to the reps and then they're very, they're much more prepared and versus getting caught off guard when they get those calls. Excellent, Colleen, anything you wanna jump in with here? Well, I, I think we hit the healthcare delivery. What doctors, nurses, et cetera, are doing every day is about control and about process. And so having those rules and understanding what that looks like is part of the DNA. Um, that's the easy piece in, in a lot of ways. I love the, the bots and, and the using technology to enable um, and drive security. But I also wanna answer this, not from a clinical perspective, but from a vendor perspective. Um, you know, One of the things that we've done at Highland over the last several years is unify the conversations around security and risk to look at all industries. So my focus is in healthcare, um, about uh, a little more than 40% of our customers are healthcare organizations, which means 60% of our customers don't know healthcare at all. So if we think about those other bad actor examples, Teresa, um, we get exposed in many ways to what's going on in other industries and other geographies and other languages um, as, as a content provider. One of the things that we've been working on and, and thinking about as a vendor, how can we help share those stories appropriately within our community? Because there's a lot to be learned from what's working and you know what, what some of the stumbles may have been. Uh, but it's fascinating, you know, when the well-publicized crowd strike issue happened several weeks ago, uh, we actually had, my team had several healthcare organizations where we were working with them every day, say, hey, we're seeing a strange behavior. Is this an issue we need to call into Highland about? And I will tell you within about 20 minutes, my team were text teamsing, emailing, saying, is anybody else seeing this? Anybody else seeing this? And we were reaching out to customers um, saying, we're not seeing this. We think something bigger is going on. You need to you know, keep us in the loop. Do you need us to do anything? But it was amazing how quickly as a vendor, we were able to come together and say back to you know uh, the folks we're working with every day, whoa, something's going on. So um, really interesting take, right? Not not necessarily the responsibility that a vendor wants to take on, but when you talk about partnership, yeah. that's the kind of communication. Yeah. Yeah, Colleen, as you were speaking through it is, you're right. I mean, we we use this internally as there's vendors and there's partners, right? Yeah. Vendors may sell you a technology, make sure that it's transactional and it works and then you may not see them again. Partners are those that are with us along the journey till the end yeah. or even when there is no renewal they're still there with us yeah. because they they understand that they have a wealth of information across all of healthcare and outside of healthcare when we're talking about cybersecurity, it's not just healthcare it's all it's industry not. based on yeah. the same risks that we have different levels of risk depending on their mission but i mean when that crowd strike situation happened and we knew about it 
we were reaching out to our partners to make sure they weren't impacted because if they were, our third party systems could be impacted, even yeah. though in that scenario, we may or may not have been a crowd strike shop, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, it was just amazing to see how all of our partners came together to help us through yeah. through that event. Um, and it, it, it means a lot. I feel like that they they didn't have to do that and, and they did and just the knowledge sharing and transfer was was very much well received. From yeah. organization. One of my customer success managers uh, coined this phrase, I'm going to uh, use it, but she said, sometimes you just need to be emotional security. So what she means by that is like the, 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 the group on the other end, whether it's digital or on the phone saying, got it, got it. You're doing the right thing. What else, what else do you need? And I think, you know, when we're talking about whether it's the services desk inside the four walls of an organization or the bigger walls in our healthcare ecosystem. Like that, that's the magic sauce that we're all trying to figure out how to how to make and share with each other. Excellent, excellent. I, want, I just wanna make one point, something I think is really important and then to go to an audience question. Um, from some of our discussion here, um, you've got a really good org chart kind of governance setup to where there is a strong connection and, and Teresa, I think use the word synergies between help desk, IT and IT security. So I think that's really, really important that there's no disconnect between cybersecurity and the help desk just on paper to where those that influence is more difficult to get. And that 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 relationship, it's obviously got to be very strong. So I uh, just want to make that point. Uh, audience questions I want I want to go to. How do you handle verification of employees for password resets? We have a self-service portal of sorts, but we find that most folks still call our service desk to have them reset. So Kathy, let's go with you first. Um, I know we're trying to move people in that direction, yeah. but if we're not seeing the uptake, people still loving to call, are we just accepting that and we deal with the calls because we know that's what people want or are we trying to shepherd them over? Yeah, so we also have a self-service uh, portal for password resets, and we encourage that any way and every way we yeah. can. <laughs> there are people that like to talk to a person, right? They just don't want to read or go to web pages, <laughs> do any of that. So what we do then is if someone does call for that, we don't reset the password for them, but we walk them through the steps on how to do it through the portal. And that is very well accepted by our users. So that is the approach that, that we take. We don't really process, the, the, we don't process any um, password resets uh, requests through the phone or through chat, but we will take a call and guide them mm -hmm. through the process um, through the portal. Very good, Teresa. We do the same and, and whoever to ask that question, it, it may be helpful is that, um, we made it very difficult for them to get to us for password reset. It was a strategic decision because we we saw the themes of the calls coming in to help us. And the number one theme was password reset. And it just blew our mind because like it, password self-service has been out there for eight months and we've been doing so many newsletters and campaigns. They're not reading it, right? <laughs> so here's what we did. Um, and feel free to share this too, is we we fronted our desk when we started this new strategy with our automated IVR. Mm -hmm. And the IVR said, did you know that you can now self-service your password reset by going to www. a very short link, right? Um, please, and then we said it in different languages, right? And just kept on going to rotate. And it's like, but if you would still like to speak with someone, please press two, okay? So then let's just say they didn't want to do any of that. They press two. We made them wait for 20 minutes. Oh no. And it was the same message back and forth, back and forth. And we're hoping by 20 minutes, if you're not having access issues, you're not very productive. Right? How mm -hmm. are you getting into your systems? And it was the data was just so insightful. I I I do suggest if you want to really drive cultural changes, you have to take bold steps like that. And then we started seeing the numbers go down. And, but I will say we had a couple hundreds over the past few months that still wait the 20 minutes. They're like, oh, just put you on speed dial and, and wait. 
when we get that call, we do what Kathy said. Let me walk you through the message you've just heard for 20 minutes, all right? And then like, oh, it's that easy? Okay, that's how that, it took us that long to change the culture and the behavior because people get complacent and people at the point, they don't mind. Like she said, they don't wanna read a, an article. They don't wanna go to another website, you know, outside of the intranet to do this, but it, it was something that we had to do to start changing the um, behaviors of our end users for password reset. And Teresa, there's some real, there's some real meaning behind this. So there's some messaging behind this that could be meaningful is what I'm saying, which is, listen, if you continue to need to talk to a person to reset your password, which you don't, you're taking up time of our help desk individuals who could be helping a clinician who's trying to log in so they could take care of a patient or whatever the case may be, meaning you can help patients, you can help the health system by doing this in an automated fashion. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. We're 100% aligned. Because that so, 20 minutes, they can unlock Epic Access because of some, you know, user issue, right? Or help help provide access to a new hire that may not have done it correctly. And so that's that was the intent of why we took yeah. those, you know, old so measures. Make you had to make them a little uncomfortable, I guess, here and there. Okay, um, we we have time for a, a question. Colleen, do you have a question for one or both of your colleagues? Well. So, so this is something that I'm struggling with as, as we're trying to continue to drive automation. How do you both think about budgeting and the cost for your next budget cycle to you know, take care of all the security challenges that you have? I mean, how do you even start to get your brain around what's going to be needed as part of your next fiscal year ask? Kathy, we'll start with you. Sure, you know, and we just we're actually going through our budget uh, cycle planning right now, so it's a very timely question. Um, so, as I mentioned, even in, in my intro, we employ a defense in depth strategy, and we are continually um, evaluating the tools in our toolbox, as well as the people and the threats, and really just doing an overall risk analysis or risk assessment that to help us determine what's the most appropriate. What's the area we need to be really focusing on or embellishing, enhancing, or even changing? Because there's been so much, um, so much change in, in, this, in this market. Tools come and go, uh, products get bought and sold, companies merge, you know, th there's a lot of activity going on. So staying on top of it, to your point, is very challenging, but making sure that you have defense in depth kind of um, it protects you a little bit against that because if something does happen to one of the products or it becomes not as effective as another, you know you have something else there that kind of overlays and complements that to provide those added layer protection. So we have, um, you know, we use a chart. We have a chart with, that outlines the different areas, endpoint protection, network protection, data protection. And then we fill that in and update it just to make sure we have all the different areas covered. And then we compare that against what's going on in the world, what's going on in, in our own, you know, our own environment. What are the types of threats and, and um, what are the types of issues we have, whether it's with, um, you know, some tech debt that might be out there, meaning older hardware, software, vendor that only runs on this old, you know, old operating system. So we have to basically accept this risk, but how do we protect against risk? So it's a continuous process. Um, and we try to obviously, you know, budget is always of concern. We have to balance, you know, how much we invest in security. And I call it an investment because it really is an investment in securing the environment and, and weighing that against the value and, and the risk that might come out of that. And using the various committees and uh, and the board up to and including the board in making those really tough decisions about where to draw the line and um, and where you you know where money is best um, best spent. So it's a continuous process. It there's no right or wrong way. A lot of it is just really your. You're just trying to anticipate or guess what these threat actors will do. I know there's been a lot of focus, as we've all know, on AI. And so we're really looking at products and services that have 
the good AI uh, capabilities embedded that, that can be used for threat detection and response, for user behavior analytics, to automate some of the response activities so we can be more efficient and keep the cost down, but yet keeping that same level of security and control. So as the threat actors get more sophisticated, so do the tools and technology, and it's constantly uh, a balancing act to make sure that the two are aligned. Excellent. Teresa, any thoughts on budgeting? Um, yeah, I can just quickly add to this. For, for us, I feel that there's no such thing as budget season for security leaders or technology leaders. It's an ongoing conversation that we need to have with our operational partners and our executives every single day. Um, because the reason why is by the time you get to budget season and you have a big ask, no one remembers what the ROI or what what was in it for them with all the investments that we've made throughout the entire fiscal year, right? So leading conversations with data is so critical, right? Talking about um, the, the situations that happened where our team was able to respond fast through people process technology, putting that front and center regularly will keep that top of mind for our CFOs and our executive or senior board members where they're thinking about why is Teresa coming in asking for more money each year for cybersecurity? Or why is why does the budget continue to rise for technology? Because really the investments and the budget is not just cybersecurity's budget, it's really the entire organization's budget because we went back to say security is everyone's responsibility, right? So applications and solutions that are legacy needs to be refreshed and updated. That doesn't sit in my security leader's budget, that sits in my solutions leader budget, right? Data center, access points, phones, mobility, that sits in my CTO's budget. So for us, security investments are in almost every single cost center that we have within Texas Children's and, and even our PMO, right? We're, we have a focused, um, set of PMs that work on 50% security, availability, reliability, kind of like core IT projects to keep the environment safe and updated. And then the other half works on business development, new problem statements for clinical and operations teams, strategic imperatives, right? Improving user experience and improving access to the hospital. So it's a very even spread, I feel, with um, when we talk about cybersecurity investments. But I I do think that one message that I can share with those on the call is that don't wait till budget season talk to talk about the investments. Talk about it throughout the entire year and keep it top of mind. That's perfect. We're almost out of time. Colleen, I give you an opportunity for a quick final parting thought for the for the folks listening today. Well, this has been a fun conversation. Um, you know, having watched your organizations both professionally and uh, care for family members of mine. Um, I, I just, your commitment to security, to partnership with, you know, your your services uh, organization, your help desk services group. I, I just think there's so much that others can learn. And so, you know, thank you for taking the time to participate in this conversation. Um, what you talked about and how to prepare and how to think about things are challenges that we all have. They're going to continue to escalate and become more intense. Um, but sharing, you know, what works for your organizations is really great. I appreciate your your engagement, and Anthony. Certainly, having this bringing this conversation together has been so terrific. Um, thank you. No, well, it's been my pleasure. Absolutely. All right, regarding continuing education, you could use the final slide in this deck as a certificate of attendance. You'll receive an email when the on-demand recording is ready for viewing. If you wanna work with us, you can reach out to Nancy Wilcox from our team and go to our website to register for upcoming panels. With that, I wanna thank this tremendous panel, wonderful discussion today, Kathy Hughes, Teresa Tonthat, Colleen Surhall, and Highland Healthcare for sponsoring, and thank you for attending. And with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Take care.